They say a good horse is worth more than riches. If you live in Tiverton, Rhode Island, you probably have both. But the horses of one prominent family are about to become the only witnesses to a shocking murder that scandalizes an entire community. This is how Marianne Escobar and her beloved Max start every morning in the peaceful horse country of Tiverton, Rhode Island. I love him so much. He's my best friend. But the line between friends and enemies can be blurred, as Marianne and her neighbors will learn one tragic night. That night was a dark and gloomy night. Wind and rain, you just knew that something was going to happen. There was a chill in the air. It looks like Marianne's premonition has come true when police receive a frantic 911 call from the home of her neighbors, Cooper and Patricia Jakes. 911 emergency. I got someone here that's either dead or dying. Here, you come down here quick. The initial call came in as a medical call to a residence on Nanaquawket Road, a possible sudden death. I responded to the scene. A distraught Cooper Jakes leads investigators to the horse barn, where he fears his wife Patricia has fallen victim to a heart attack. The body was found here on the ground, face up. Nick Maltese sees he's too late, but he also sees this was no heart attack. She had been shot several times, possibly as many as nine times. The victim's husband claims the news is a complete surprise. Cooper told us that he had not heard any shots or any commotion. He wasn't alerted to the barn for any other reason than looking for his wife. Patricia's shocked husband is taken into custody as both a witness and a suspect. People in domestic relationships sometimes uh, disagree and there are problems. He's a person of interest and somebody that we needed to talk to to find out what happened to Patricia. Investigators continue to process the scene for clues. This clearly was not a heart attack, and there was no evidence of a robbery that had occurred. But they do have one lead. Witnesses advise that a white pickup truck was seen leaving the area around the time of the incident. Police immediately put out an APB for the truck and bring Cooper Jakes back to the station for further questioning. Meanwhile, as the sun rises, Talk of the murder is on every menu in Tiverton, especially at the Family Ties restaurant. I can't believe there was a murder in Tiverton last night. No, I can't either. What a shock to everyone. I just hope they find out what happened. They will. Patricia and her husband, Cooper, are pillars of this small community. Pat was involved in a garden club. She was the president of the garden club for a while. She was a nice, nice lady. She was with her horses. She told me she was going to take me horseback riding sometime, you know. Patricia is known not just for her devotion to her horses, but also for her keen business sense. Using the talents of craftsmen like Manny Cabral, Patricia ran a successful flag-making company. She was really savvy for business. And I don't think there was anybody that could encompass her workmanship. Even when I was doing the work for her, she had an eye on me. She, uh, she was like, this better be right, this better be right. <laughs> and I said, don't worry, Pat, you'll get it right. Manny is devastated when he learns his friend has been murdered. I couldn't believe it. I think I even had tears in my eyes because she, I, I couldn't think of anybody who would have hurt her that much. Another person who has tears in her eyes is Patricia's personal assistant, Chris Giannini. Oh, I was taken back. It was hard. We were, we were really good friends. And now, it's up to the Tiverton PD to solve the mystery. Fortunately, solving mysteries is Detective Elwood Johnson's specialty. The first order of business for me in this investigation was to conduct a thorough interview of Mr. Jakes. He was the first person to discover that Patricia had been killed. Cooper claims he was watching television when Patricia was killed. He watched the evening news and dozed off. When he awoke, he started to go and look for her. I walked up to the uh, barn, she was laying there, and I tried to see what any pups. 
Uh, when he arrived at the barn, he found Patricia dead or dying, as he said in his 911 call. And he swears he heard nothing. He did not see the gunshot wounds. He wasn't aware that she had been shot. But detectives are about to make a discovery that throws Cooper's story into a tailspin. During the interrogation of Cooper, he leaned forward at some point during the interview and his sleeve rolled up away from his hand and we noticed that there was a discoloration on the inside of his wrist and it was blood. Could this grieving husband be hiding a deadly secret? Self-made entrepreneur Patricia Jakes is dead. Her husband Cooper is now the prime suspect in the case. We had to look at him. That it could be domestic rage. I mean, a large amount of violent crime is domestics. It's just common sense for us. And the townsfolk already have their own ideas of what happened at Northridge Farm. Mr. Jakes wasn't the easiest person to live with. I'm sure it was very difficult for Patricia. Yeah, they probably didn't get along very yeah. well. It's too bad. With his wife's blood on his hands, Cooper has a lot of explaining to do. When we told Cooper that he appeared to have blood on his wrist, he was genuinely surprised. He was not aware that it was there. And he didn't try to offer an excuse as to why it was there. But there appears to be a reasonable explanation. During Cooper's interrogation, he demonstrated for us how he discovered the body, and he showed us that he had reached down to check her carotid pulse. You said you checked for a pulse. I tried to see what any pulse. And I didn't feel any. I didn't, I, I didn't know whether I said pulse or not. The action that he demonstrated was consistent with what we saw on his wrist. It wasn't a high-velocity blood spatter. It was a contact transfer smear. There may be an explanation for the blood on Cooper's wrist, but his wife is still riddled with bullets. You can't rule anybody out too early in an investigation. You have to gather facts and determine what's suspicious and what's verified. So we asked him if he'd be willing to submit to a gunshot residue test. Cooper agrees, and the test is sent to the lab for analysis. You're suspicious of everyone when you're going into this because you don't know who to believe. Detectives turn to the crime scene photos to see if his story checks out. Let's spread this stuff out and take a good look at it. Cooper told us he didn't hear any commotion, never heard any shots of any kind. He did not see the gunshot wounds. He wasn't aware that she had been shot. Look at this estate. It's huge. I mean, look how far off this barn is from the road, from the entrance to the driveway, right? This is where Cooper's watching TV. So the rapport of a small caliber weapon may not have been heard from down here. The rapport of the weapon would have been absorbed by the barn, by the bush, and the open air. So taking all those things into account, it's plausible that a person, especially elderly, would not have been able to hear the sound of a discharged firearm. Is it possible that someone killed Patricia right under Cooper's nose? Someone could have drove onto the property without Mr. Jakes being aware of it. By some. And you wouldn't see any lights coming up the driveway because of the trees here and the house is situated below the barn. Right. Detectives still need more evidence to eliminate Cooper as a suspect. And back at the crime lab, the results are in. What do you have? If you recall, that night I used this collection type apparatus and I sampled Cooper Jakes's back of his hands. These were then sent off to the lab for analysis and as a result, they came back negative for any gunshot residue. The tests show that Cooper Jakes did not fire a weapon. Correct. Investigators feel confident that Cooper Jakes did not kill his wife. We found him to be credible based on things that he shared with us that we could verify that evening. With a killer still on the loose, Detective Johnson and his partner Nick Tella take another look at the crime scene. How many shots did the autopsy? A total of seven uh, bullet holes in the victim. A close range, seven shots, and then dispersed around the torso. I don't believe there were any shots to the victim's head. Probably a uh, crime of passion, uh, revenge. Someone deliberately shot her. It wasn't an accidental discharge of one round. It was multiple shots. You said seven. This wasn't a, a random act of violence. I think it's someone that knows her or was close to her that she trusted. Detectives dig deeper, knowing a murderer is lurking in Patricia's background. Based on the interviews we've had thus far, I'm not aware of anybody that didn't get along with her that had less than a favorable relationship with her. As you said, she doesn't appear to have any enemies. Still, Patricia was a wealthy woman, and everyone knows money is the root of all evil. It sounds to me like we need to look into her financial dealings. It wouldn't be the first time that money was the motive for murder. Sure enough, when detectives investigate the Jake's financial dealings, 
they find a few answers. We learned through financial investigation that there was a pending civil litigation and judgment was issued out against the Jakes and that they were basically expected to, uh, to pay some money and remedy to this civil litigation. The lawsuit left the Jakes in financial stress, a fact that was well known to Patricia's personal assistant, Chris, and her colleague, Manny. She was looking for money and she'd be calling me all the time. And she was worried about what was going to happen with the horses. But on the day she was murdered, Patricia told her assistant, Chris, that her money troubles were almost over. She told me she should make sure expecting a package that was going to have $50,000 in it. 50000 she told me that was coming from the people in New Hampshire. Did someone decide it was easier to kill than pay up? At the Family Ties restaurant in Tiverton, Rhode Island, the special of the day is fear. Do they know who did it? Did they find him? It had to be somebody she knew. Why do you say that? Because she had a dog. She had a big German Shepherd. German Shepherd's not going to let somebody in the house that he doesn't know. That's right. I can't believe this happened in Tiverton. Such a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Well, I guess we'll think twice about keeping our doors unlocked, huh? I'll be locking my doors. But investigators in the murder of Patricia Jakes have jumped on a new lead. According to Chris Giannini, Patricia told her that she was expecting $50,000 from a couple in New Hampshire for some property that they were interested in. Was Patricia murdered over a business deal gone bad? Hey, Nick. Our investigators did track down this couple from New Hampshire. They were not supposed to provide $50,000 or any amount of money to Patricia. There had been no discussion about that with Patricia prior to her death. Why would Patricia lie? Her assistant, Chris, has no idea. But she does offer one more intriguing detail. Okay, bye-bye. Chris Giannini told us as well that Patricia had told her that she was expecting a call from Chester. Chester Briggs is a fellow horseman and a dear friend of Patricia's. Pat and Chester were really good friends. They were close with each other. With the, you know, they both loved the horses, and um, he was close with their kids. On the day she was murdered, Patricia was desperate to talk to Chester. Pat had gone out. She told me that Chester Briggs was going to be calling and that I should be expecting a phone call from him, that she was waiting for him to call. Pat seemed like she was a little anxious about getting the call, and I wasn't really sure why. With no other leads, detectives Johnson and Tella go to Chester Briggs' home in New Hampshire to question him. When we arrived here in New Hampshire, we approached Mr. Briggs' residence. We knocked on the main door. There was no response, so we proceeded to the next door apartment, which was attached to the main dwelling. And we spoke to uh, Bob Quartermarsh. He rented from Mr. Briggs. We asked him if he knew where Mr. Briggs was. He said he was at work. But something tells these seasoned investigators to stick around. We conducted a roving surveillance, kept passing by Mr. Briggs' home to see if we could connect with him when he arrived. And shortly after that visit, we saw Chester Briggs' truck leaving his residence with Mr. Quartermarsh behind the wheel. Chester's white truck is a perfect match for the one seen leaving Patricia's residence the night of the murder. We followed him into the town of Pittsfield, and we saw him throw a bag of garbage into a dumpster. Myself and other detectives went to that dumpster, retrieved that garbage bag, and we determined that it belonged to Mr. Briggs, based on the refuse inside. And what do they find inside the bag? The first thing that we saw was this pair of sneakers, which appeared to be in relatively good condition, except for the mud on the soles. Mud that reminds Detective Johnson of the cold night at the barn where Patricia was shot. I mean, the fact that he threw them away to me suggests, all right, if you're an innocent person, why throw things away? But there's more. In addition to the sneakers, we found a piece of scrap paper in the garbage bag that had the victim's phone number with the figure 50,000 written right next to it. Perhaps it was Chester Briggs that owed Patricia $50,000, and not the couple from New Hampshire. We were very suspicious of that because we knew the victim, Patricia Jakes, was waiting for $50,000, and it's very suspicious to us that this trash that belongs to Mr. Briggs contained her phone number and the figure 50000 along with these sneakers. When Chester Briggs returns home, he's immediately brought in for questioning. We interviewed Mr. Briggs at New Hampshire State Police Headquarters for almost 12 hours. And during that time, he gave us a number of answers, but he always denied having any involvement in Patricia's death. Michael, did you have any involvement in past killing? No, not at all. And then you want to stick to that. Patricia was killed in the state of Rhode Island. 
And Chester has an alibi for that night. Mr. Briggs told us that he never left the state of New Hampshire. He said that he visited two apartment houses that he owns in the town of Pittsfield. He also said that he went south in New Hampshire to the Manchester Mall. And then he said at about 11 o'clock at night, he made two cellular phone calls. He was adamant that he never left the state of New Hampshire. With no conclusive evidence against Briggs, investigators have to let him go. But the whole town is buzzing. Do you think a good friend could actually do something like that? I don't know. I can't believe he would actually kill her. It's just crazy. Investigators suspect Briggs is their killer. So they return to his alibi to find a weakness in his story. I mean, his alibi just makes no sense. From 8.45 until 10.30 p.m., he tells us that he goes to the New Hampshire mall. Then after I tell him that the mall closed earlier at 10 o'clock, he changes his story. He clearly was reeling in his tracks. And he also says that he makes a phone call from the mall to his, uh, to his friend. I think he's trying to fill in this time period that we're looking yeah, at. It bothers me is he says he goes all the way down to the Manchester Mall to buy his friend a gift. That was his reason for going down there. But he admits he was in there and he never bought a thing. For two and a half hours, and walking around. So it just doesn't, it, it, none of it makes sense. It doesn't ring true to me. But there's no way to find out if Chester is telling the truth. We didn't have anything concrete. Or is there? Detective Johnson always likes to keep up to date on his training. But he never dreamed a new skill would help him solve a case so soon. I attended a cellular telephone seminar. One of the portions of that seminar was about the ability to track historically where a person was within a one to three mile radius when they made a cell phone call. Chester Briggs has adamantly claimed that he never left the state of New Hampshire on the night of the murder, but he never imagined his cell phone records could prove otherwise. Reflecting on Mr. Briggs' statement and the fact that he made these calls prompted me to seek a subpoena for his cell phone records. The trace on Chester's phone calls returns a priceless piece of evidence that takes this case from a trot to a full gallop. When we received the records, we learned that Mr. Briggs had lied. He wasn't in New Hampshire when he made those calls. He was in Massachusetts, which directly contradicted his alibi. And the fact that he allegedly never left the state of New Hampshire on the night that she was killed, it put him between the state that he lives in and the state that Patricia died in. Chester has obviously been lying about his whereabouts. But was he at Patricia's farm on the night of her murder? We knew from a witness that the shots were fired at about 9.30 at night, and we knew from Chester and from the cell phone records that the calls were made at about 11 o'clock. question I had, was it physically possible for a person to have killed Patricia Jakes at about 9.30, travel a route north to where the calls were made? Detective Johnson decides to find out. He chose the same night of the week and obviously the same time of day because that's the conditions that were probably met by the suspect the night that she was killed. Detective Johnson starts out from Patricia's farm at 9.30 p.m., driving north. When the clock hits 11 o'clock sharp, he's stunned. I looked at the clock in the car. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Through the mist, Detective Johnson sees the cell phone tower that picked up the calls Chester Briggs made the night of the murder. For me, it was just a sense of conviction. He did it. You know, he did it. He had time to do it, and he did it. And when investigators conduct further interviews in the area, they get one more critical detail. We had a gas station attendant located a mile away from the victim's home tell us that Mr. Briggs was there the night that she was killed. Gas in his truck. Chester Briggs is arrested for the murder of Patricia Jakes. With a killer in custody, things are sunny side up again at the Family Ties restaurant. I wonder how long he's going to go away for. Hopefully, a long, long time. Mm. Guess you can't trust your best friends these days. At trial, Chester finally admits that Patricia had given him almost $100,000 to hide from her creditors. When she asked for it back, it was too late. He had already spent it. To avoid repayment and to avoid responsibility for not having the money to give back to her, he killed her. After only three hours of deliberation, the jury finds Chester Briggs guilty of murder. I think the sentiment we all left with was, it was just sad. Sad that somebody died over money. Chester is sentenced to 50 years in prison. Oh, she was loved by everybody. 
She was a, a, a rock in the community. I mean, she, she was just a good, good, good lady. Trust, like money, can often be spent on the wrong person. In her will, Patricia had left $10,000 for the care of her horses to her dear friend, Chester Briggs. 